And we're back with the Hendrix Gin Kill You. So it's been about two weeks. Let's find out what the reading on this is. See if it's done. I see it still actively bubbling, but when I look, I'm not seeing a lot of activity up the sides. This tells you something is happening. There's gases escaping for some reason. Looking here and seeing bubbles coming up actively tells you fermentation is probably still happening. The fact that there's very little, mm. But I do see a slight foam yeah. air layer at the very top of our goop. But there is bubble. only one way to find <laughs> out for sure. And being that this has a spigot on the side here, I'm just gonna take a reading really easily. Put this down here, open it up. Ooh. Do I wanna take this off? Yeah, you wanna take the, that off because it's sucking that back in. Not that that's a huge issue, but you probably don't want it to happen anyway. So let me just fill this guy up. My only issue with doing it with the spigot this way is it does have to go through some air, but you could attach a hose to it and all that, but by the time you do that, you might as well just take a sample the normal way. So. Does it add more convenience? I don't, I don't know really. Looks like it's sitting at 1.024. So this, this probably isn't done yet. Let me just take some notes here. And uh, see, now I have to take the lid off to put this back in. Some people will dump these out. I don't like to do that. I wanna keep that sample. Um, but you know, there's a little bit of risk involved in opening this up. By the way, I have been giving this a shake at least once a day to keep that cap moving. It smells like juniper berries in there. Makes me happy, makes Brian sad. Yeah, not my favorite <laughs> smell. But hey, that's the essence of homebrew, is making stuff that you like. You know, she likes certain things, I like certain things. So we meet in the middle and we make both. Now being that I disturbed this and I could have added some oxygen in there, it's not a huge thing to worry about, but it is something to be aware of. What I wanna do is just give this a little bit of a swirl like this. See, I'm just getting all the things moving and you see that airlock is starting to bubble. That's gases coming out. That's CO2 replacing any oxygen that might've been put in here. And in that way, I'm kind of protecting. It's not 100% protection, but it's an extra little protective layer. And it's something good to do anyway. I get everything moving again and give it another chance to uh, get back to work. So all the CO2 is going to come up through the solution and come up into the air, pushing all the oxygen out because CO2 is heavier than oxygen. Yes. So now we're just gonna let this sit for another week, maybe two weeks, and we'll take another reading and see how it's doing. All right, so it's been about two more weeks and uh, it's time to take a second reading on this. And as you can see, we have a preemptive empty fermenter here, which means we're pretty sure it's ready to be racked. At least I hope so. So let's uh, get this out of there. Take that for me. Get my reading is fundamental type stuff here. We got the Mega Maid, which is just a syringe with a piece of tubing. We have a graduated cylinder and there should be a hydrometer around here somewhere. There it is. And everything here has been sanitized in... The Red Bucket of Sanitization! We also have all of these items, link in the description below, for your convenience. So that way, if there's an item that you need that you don't currently have, you can get it. Now, if you can see from your vantage point, I am holding the base of this graduated cylinder because sometimes this procedure gets a little violent. And as Brian is focusing on trying to get the sample out, He's not, focused? <laughs> he's not really focusing on keeping the graduated cylinder from toppling over. So, if you have an assistant who has an opposable thumb. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have dogs or cats that you can train. Uh, yeah, you know. have them stabilize things for you. It's a good thing. When last we left this, it was at 1.024. I let it go for two more weeks. Today it's at 1.000. I know I always say, take two readings. When they stop changing, that's when it's time to rack. Well. I'm gonna be impatient today, and it's at 1.000. The likelihood that it's not done is about, oh, I don't know, almost 0%. So it's okay, I'm going to rack it. At a certain point, common sense has to take it, take over. Now, beyond that, we're YouTubers, so we're constantly pushing to try to get information out to you. You're a home brewer, so you can take as long as you wish 
Yeah. So, if this was just for me, I'd let it sit another few days and yeah. then check again. Yeah. But we have a schedule. And yes, I poured that right into the secondary fermenter because if I poured it back into here, I might have disturbed least, things like that. There's a ton of spices, berries, and stuff in here. I don't want any more of that in here than I have to. That said, it's something in particular for this particular beverage that we have to take in consideration. Not only do we have the lease that is settled to the bottom, but we have a layer of floaties at the top. So when we rack this, we want to make sure that the end of our autosiphon is in the area in between well, at all times. This is the one with the siphon on it, the siphon. Oh. So we're Making me wonder if I it. even want to use this well, this time. See, that's interesting. It's in the middle, though. It's perfect. It's the perfect location. But all that stuff coming down, it's going to get sucked in. Well, we can... And you know what? When we rack it again, we can worry about that. Today, we're just going to use the siphonless. And all I'm going to do is just attach a piece of tubing, which we have over there. Can you hand me a piece of tubing? Something of note. Uh, this is a 1.4 gallon little big mouth bubbler, siphonless version. That means it has this little spigot on the end here. And I'm just going to attach some tubing to that, just briefly, if I can get it on there. It's kind of fiddly, but it's okay. Just because enough it, to put it on there. It actually works pretty well in the little bit of we've used it. Uh, you want to make sure that it's on good, so it's not going to pop off on you, but you don't want to force it all the way on there, or never you'll get never get it off. Now, I'm going to a one gallon fermenter here. That way, there's gonna be very little headspace, okay? It's not a huge deal, but if I put it back into one of these, which we don't have many of these, so there'd be more headroom, and we don't really want that. There's a lot of spices, a lot of pieces and bits in here. Some of it's gonna get in here, and that's okay. Like I said, we're gonna worry about that on the second racking, but for today, I'm just gonna put this hose in this end, lower it a bit, and turn on the spigot, and voila. We have a siphon happening. Another thing you may want to consider, if you haven't considered it already, is that you want to make sure that there is way for the pressure to equalize. So you either need to take the leave the airlock the out. airlock out, which we did, or just remove the cap entirely, because it's going to stop things or slow things and create a. I'm probably not sealing it all that. Yeah, long. so we're we're not going to do did that. Did you hear that? But that's see, a vacuum. Yeah, that's why. Oh, it did slow down. Oh yeah. Bit. All right, so when we were racking it, we tilted it ever so slightly and ever so gently. So that way our clear liquid layer stayed in contact with the, uh, the spigot area. So there was a little bit more residual, but as you can see, we went clear up to here in our one gallon. So we are completely happy with what we have accomplished yep. here. That's, and that's the advantage to using the 1.4 gallon is you can pretty much end up with one gallon when you're done. We ended up losing maybe that much of a yeah. line across, I mean, what's that, a few ounces? Uh, which does kind of suck a little bit because you did make that and all, but we ended up with a cleaner product as a result. So if you expect that loss, it's not a big deal. And it's really difficult to tell how much of that was actual usable liquid because we right. did have a significant layer on the top as well as the bottom. Like that much, yeah. So, so it was really hard to not keep it clean. I don't think we lost that much. Yeah. And it, when we're looking at this, it's slightly cloudy with only a very few of the solids that made it through this. Yeah, I think we did good. So we are going to to rack it again once everything settles out, uh, but I'm pretty happy so far. So we'll see you when we rack it again. It's been about another week and we're ready to rack this again. As you can see, most of our sediment that we had has actually settled out. We do have a little bit of what we like to call floaties sitting at the top and that's just some of the residual solids that decided not to settle out to the bottom. Pieces of berries. So we've got out the sock. Now this is not an actual sock, it's an actual brewing implement, but we're using it to cover our entry area of our auto siphon to try to keep those larger chunks out. All right, so as usual, we're going to siphon this, but I'm just gonna hold the end of this because I really don't want to introduce anything foreign into the uh, brew. This has been sanitized. Everything that we're going to use has been sanitized, and as always, we're going to put that end into the pitcher, lower this end into this, higher, and start to siphon up. We did go back and forth as to whether we put the bag in the pitcher or in here, and 
I determined, well, we determined, Derica actually said it, that the bigger pieces might not be good for the auto siphon. So rather than clog it up, we decided let's just put it here and see what happens. I can always move this bag around if, as I need to, but it seems to be working out okay. We're probably gonna lose a little bit more volume at the bottom because I do have the cap on the end on purpose. There's some junk in there, some floaties we just don't want. So we're gonna do the best we can. Someone the other day mentioned that all they want is to separate the lease from their brew and they don't wanna have any loss. Well, we'd all like that. However, it is part of brewing to have some amount of loss. Once you've come to accept that, life is so much easier. You just move on and it's all right. If you make larger batches, there's percentage-wise less loss. So that is one way to overcome that. Um, by making one gallon batches, just a couple ounces of loss seems like a lot. So yeah, there is that. So talking about loss, that's how much loss we had at the bottom. Just a little bit, it's a few ounces. I thought we were gonna have a lot more because I had the cap on. It really didn't turn out to be that much. It stayed pretty clear the whole way, so I'm pretty happy with that. If it had gone cloudy, like if I had stirred anything up, we'd have to rack this again. So I wanted to be able to bottle this today. All right, so before we get to the bottling, let's just do a quick sample taste to see if any adjustments need to be made. Right off the bat, I'm gonna say it's pretty clear. It's not perfectly clear, but it's, it's like a nine. Interesting smell. Smells uh, a little bit less juniper now than it did before but still quite strong on the juniper. If you get a really deep breath, then you get the juniper notes, but on, on the, the could've, front could've taste and it. it's more floral, I would say. Okay, this finished at 1.000. It tastes sweet. I taste sweetness in there. I taste goodness in there. That's actually not bad. Yeah, I think with some age, this is going to be actually pretty exceptional. And I don't like gin. Just saying. Not my thing. This is gonna, this is pretty good. So I don't think it needs any adjustments. Do you? I'm no? so happy right now. Yeah, just... this, this came out way better than I thought it was gonna. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I did not have high expectations, as you can tell. So we also have um, like 130 ounces here. So it's gonna be five full bottles. That's a cool thing about the one gallon fermenters like that, is they're actually a little bit more than a gallon. They're like 1.2 gallons. So if you fill it all the way and you can keep it that full without even through the racking process, it's all good. I think we actually started with a big mouth bubbler. In this we time. did, yep. So there you go. Start with a big mouth bubbler, you end up with a full gallon plus two ounces. So we have five bottles because this is going to take a full five bottles. And bottling is the same as racking. We use an auto siphon. I just put the bottling wand on the end. It has a springy thingy, also known as a stem valve. And what that happens is as you push this down, the liquid can flow, lift up, it stops. Very, very important. Make sure it is pushed down when you start the siphon. So many people have actually said that they've had a problem with that where they were trying to start it and the bottling wand just made a mess and it introduced oxygen and that kind of thing. So if you have a partner, as we do, your partner is going to depress so that the stem valve is activated while okay. you start the siphon in. But I have to lower this. I just wanted to show you that that's what we're doing. Let's see. See, ta -da. That's what you do. Where but if, it's not gonna siphon right Where now. if it wasn't depressed, the siphon wouldn't be able to start because it would have no place to go. Because that And be you can introduce extra oxygen that way. It fizzes up and makes yeah. foam. So don't do that. So we're gonna fill these bottles. Be back in a minute. So this is kind of unprecedented. We got five full bottles because normally a full gallon is 3.75 liters. But if you start with a full gallon, you'll end up cutting down and down and down and down and down and you end up with usually four, four and a half. But because we started with a larger container when we racked down and lost a little bit of product each time, we ended up with five full bottles. Really, really cool. And that's why we really enjoy using the little big mouth bubbler, particularly when we're doing a beverage that's going to have a lot of solids in initial fermentation. Because those solids, being that they're solid, take up a lot of volume. And that volume is not gonna end up in our final bottling. 
that actually brings up a question that came up on the channel just the other day. Someone said, do we adjust the recipe for using the Big Mouth Bubbler? Actually, no. I make the recipe for the Big Mouth Bubbler expecting it to go down. So sort of, but not exactly. It actually works in the opposite. If I was to make that recipe for a wide mouth one gallon, I'd actually have to use less liquid. So that would mean less fermentables too to keep the same gravity. So it's still a one gallon recipe, but it is really important that you don't try making that in a regular one gallon wide mouth. You, you could get a little bit messed up. So you may have to make some adjustments, but for the most part, the answer is no, because the actual amount of volume that's taken up by all the solids comes out in the end. So it's still a one gallon recipe. I mean, this is exactly a one gallon recipe when you look at it from that perspective. Makes sense? Probably not, but that's the best I got. So uh, it's time to move on to tasting. So for this tasting, I decided to change things up and we're gonna add in the Hendrix gin, which is my inspiration for this beverage, because I wanted to see how close we came in the flavor profile. Now we know that this is a distilled beverage, so obviously ours is not going to be the exact same, but I think flavor-wise, we might be pretty close, and I wanted to see just how close we were. So what do we gotta taste first? So to start off with, we're going to sample what we came up with, give our typical impressions on it, and then we'll compare it to the gin. I'm cheating. And Brian's gonna cheat, as is the way. Interesting. They are actually, from an aroma standpoint, there's there's a similarity. Juniper's stronger on the on the gin. Yep. That's interesting. Because I would have thought that we had a lot of juniper this time. Because show you could even do more. We did two ounces of juniper berries. I think we could have done more. Yeah, but the other aroma notes that are in there, I think are pretty much the yeah. same. Obviously this one has a stronger alcohol aroma because it's a much higher ABV. So I get that almost mm -hmm. tingly sensation that you get in your sinuses when you inhale a higher ABV. But I definitely get the rose. I even get yeah. the freshness of the cucumber yeah. coming through, even in the, in the aroma. That's pretty awesome. For a five-week-old brew, that's pretty amazing. It not look the same. Obviously, color-wise, we're going to have a huge difference because, again, this is distilled, and the distillation process is going to take even more of those impurities out, yeah. as is the way with the distillation. But I'll tell you what. They're, they're, this smells like a weak gin. Yeah. It really does. Um, now, something else of note, this is 14.6%, that's ours. This is uh, 44%, so big, big difference. It's about three times three times the alcohol. Again, tastes like a weak gin. It does, it does, which makes me super happy because normally when I drink Hendrix, so I can drink more of it, I make a gin and tonic. So this is like a pre-made pre gin and yeah. tonic. So it's a cocktail. You put mead in a glass. There's your cocktail. <laughs> Actually, it's not even mead. You mm -hmm. put your your wine in a glass because technically it's a wine. It's a sugar wine. It's a kill you. You know. So. So impression wise on the flavor, I'm getting that what Brian was calling a sweetness, but I really don't think it's a sweetness. I think it's just a almost like a juicy fruit kind of sensation, and then I'm getting that that little punch of the juniper, but it's not as aggressive as you'd get from a gin, and I think that's why Brian is appreciating this at all. I don't hate it. Because if, if it was more punchy on the juniper, juniper, I don't think Brian would like it. I'm also trying to be unbiased. In other words, I know this is not for me. I know this is not my thing, and I know I never have to drink it again after today other than the one year. So, <laughs> I can be honest and appreciate it for what it is. The, uh, the ingredients were right. I think we could have gone a little heavier with the juniper, just a, just a touch, like maybe 50% more, and I think it would have been even better. I think thyme's going to be a really great ingredient for this one now. Mouthfeel, I'm getting sort of a, what I've termed before soft, but it's almost like a velvety, nice light coating on the tongue. It's not watery, but it's not super viscous. Right, It's, it's right. somewhere in the middle. Um, it's got a, a decent enough mouthfeel. It doesn't feel thin. Right. Um, it has a refreshing uh, feel to it, like it's crisp. It's very dry. It's 1.000. I would have thought this would be like mouth puckering dry. 
It's really not, especially with the juniper berries. I yeah. thought for sure this was just gonna be like, you know, like licking a sand, a, a sand dune. And it really, it's really not at all. It's, it's better than licking a sand dune. How's that for a glowing, <laughs> glowing recommendation? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't hate this. And I really thought I was going to. I'm definitely getting the rose, yeah. which is pleasing to me. The cucumber, I think, is there. If you didn't tell somebody that there was cucumber in there, I don't think they would guess. But even in Hendrick's gin, I don't really taste cucumber. Right, but I think it's a it's one of those hidden additions, kind of like yeah. raisins and yeah. lots if of other If you don't finishing. put it in, you 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 will miss it. Yeah. But you won't know why. Like someone asked, um, I think it was today. I saw a comment. Uh, maybe it was yesterday. They said, I did your beginner mead, exactly, except that I didn't put in the tea, and now it feels like something's missing. Well, it's probably the tea, because it adds tannins, it adds that extra mouthfeel, and even people that don't like tea, add the tea. It's not there for taste, it's there to be a, an ingredient in the yeah. overall structure of the brew, not for flavor. And that's kind of an interesting thing that we have learned along the way with this process in what we found different ingredients add to a beverage or may take away from the experience of a beverage, is that we, we are kind of being mad scientists here and that all these ingredients- I'm just slightly perturbed. May not come, <laughs> may not come out as what you might think they should be, yeah. but if they are removed from the equation, then you don't have a complete yeah. picture of what the experience should be. And, and so, when you're starting off, and Brian has said this, I don't know how many times, we really encourage you to follow oh, yeah. one recipe. From a trusted source, from, you've seen the result before. From beginning to finish, be until you become more acquainted with the process, so that way you can go, oh. That's how I did it. That's where that comes from, and that's where that comes from, and so if I wanted less of that aspect, then I can lower that amount, or I could eliminate it entirely, or I could bump this other aspect. But when you're first starting out, those those experiences and those things that we're trying to convey to you might not come across as clearly as we were hoping to. So we really encourage you to follow a tried and true recipe, and that way you will learn from replicating that and tasting it and enjoying it and sharing the experience with your friends and family, so that way you know what you put in there and how to replicate that further on down the line. Let me tell you a little story. I just said when I first started out, I followed known recipes. Not exactly accurate. My first couple, I watched a bunch of videos, I read a bunch of books, I read a bunch of articles and stories and said, oh, I see why they did that and I understand why they did that. And I tried piecing something together. And while they weren't completely unsuccessful, they weren't good enough that made me wanna go, yeah, I wanna drink this all the time instead of buying stuff. He also took absolutely, positively, no notes whatsoever. Oh yeah. So well, he made a few that were just so incredibly, fantastic. good. No, I mean like the good. first two or three, they were just not good. Right. I but, put it away for months and didn't touch anything. But then yeah. when you made the good ones, we were like, oh, yeah. well, what'd you do? And then I started following I recipes know. and instantly, things improved, got so much better, and I really understood what I was doing more than just throwing a bunch of stuff in a jar. It may look like that's what we do, but in reality, a lot of effort and thought goes into the planning of the recipes and research. Like, we added rose, a rose-flavored tea to this one, and I remember looking up recipes for, A, people that made a rose tea just to drink, people that used rose in various other wines, how much Hendrix might have used, which was all conjecture because nobody really knows, and various wines and meads and other brews that had rose in them to not overpower or underpower. And I think we got it right. At the end of the day, it's a judgment call and it's a bit of a guesstimate, okay? It's not a true guess because there is some research involved, but everything about this is kind of trial and error. And if it was no good, we'd, we'd have to do it again, that's all. But I knew it would come out in the ballpark of pretty good, and like I said, it probably needs a little bit more juniper. 
We also had some background experience for the different things that we're working with here because we had made a Rodamel and we knew what we didn't like about that particular beverage. Yep. We did use rose along with other fruits and stuff in our Fay wine and we saw that we needed to bump it up a little bit in that one. Uh, we really appreciate the color of both, so we, we got a similar color in this one even though we used other different ingredients. And then we knew from making the juniper mead that you're gonna need some juniper in there for it to really come through. And since we were trying to replicate a gin, we wanted to bump the volume up. You didn't even finish this yet. The, you want more? I, I want it all. All right, here. <laughs> we got more videos. So when just, Brian just was saying. talking earlier, I took another sip and I was thinking about his, his sweetness connotation. And I think our brains are tricking us into thinking that it's sweet when it's not really sweet, it's more of the mouthfeel that's making you think of juicy fruit, which you are then allowed to feel that way. Makes your brain say it's sweet. I will defend your ability to say that and feel that way. However, I disagree. It's sweet. This is this has a sweetness to it, and I'm not complaining. That's a good thing. I'm just a little surprised. Now it is possible because this is 14.6%. If it finished fully dry, it would probably be below 1.000. Sure. So there's a few sure. points yeah. of sugars still left in there. And if you don't understand why I made that statement, we have videos on how to calculate ABV and the ethanol versus water weight and density thing. There's plenty of videos on that. Um, but let me give a description of this. Let me, let me take a quick sip. Okay, Derek, I keep saying juicy fruit. I'm gonna go one step further. If you've ever had juicy fruit gum, that oh. is the initial flavor that I get okay. as soon as it enters my mouth. And that gives me a sweetness. I'm going to argue that juicy fruit is sweet, therefore it's a sweetness that she's even detecting. She's just describing it and using different words. It's my argument. She can say what she wants. Um, so I'm getting like a juicy fruit gum coming in. Then suddenly my mouth gets hit with the alcohol and the like uh, mouthfeel tannic properties. And I think the tannins came from the juniper. It's not unpleasant. Don't take anything I'm saying as an unpleasant thing. It actually cuts through that sweetness and combines that pine-like flavor of the juniper with the juicy fruit gum, making a really interesting combination that I wasn't expecting to appreciate. And add in to all of that, is like this crisp freshness. And I can only attribute that to the cucumber and the fact that it's dry. There's nothing lingering. The finish on this is actually surprisingly long. I did not think it would be. On the exhale, I definitely get a little bit of pine, a little bit of cucumber on the exhale, which is not unusual. If you eat cucumbers, you can kind of taste them for a while afterwards, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and where does the rose come into play for you? The rose is there, but it's not super strong. I feel like it's a back note through almost the whole thing. I don't get it on the entrance. I do get it on the exhale. Most definitely there's a floral rose note there. And it comes through with the tannins in the middle, making that balance work really, really well. I, I, I think this is wonderful. I actually do. I, I like this a lot better than I thought it was going to. All right, so now we're going to give this a score, and then we're going to push the envelope by comparing it to the original Hendrix Gin. Okay. All right, well, if we're going to give it a score, let me give you our rundown of the scoring system for today. Our scoring system goes from 1 to 10. 1 is the lowest score we can give. 1 means probably toxic. It's something that you dump and you definitely wouldn't want to drink. 10 means this is awesome. If I had 30 brews in front of me, this is the one I would choose. That makes it a 10. Perfection is a very subjective thing, so I don't say it that way. Would this be the one that I would choose out of all the things that we've made giving this a 10? I don't know, that's what the score is for. And the numbers in between are varying levels of toxic versus awesome. So, tox awesome, 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 I don't know, somebody will come up with a word for that. But that's the gist of it. We used to do five was like I'd drink it, and we found that four was useless and three was just not being used. So it just didn't make any sense. So there you go. That's our scoring. That's my story, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I need another set. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, Nine six point five. five. Okay. Now, there's a great disparity in numbers here, probably for a very good reason. This is not my wheelhouse. This is not my flavor combos. I don't like piney things. I just 
don't. I also don't like floral wine. So it's got two of three things against it for me. I know, she's loving this. I gave it a 6.5. What does that mean? It means it's really good. It means it's better than the three or two that I was expecting to be giving it. <laughs> okay? This came out really nice. If you like Hendrix gin and you like gin in general, you will appreciate this. That's my feeling. If you like gin, you'll appreciate this. You will see me make some interesting faces when I taste what's in that glass. Keep in mind, I drink black coffee, black tea, and whiskey. Just say it. So I give my, mine a 9.9 .9 for all the reasons 9 .5. Brian. 9.5. Uh, it should be a 9.9. .9. We don't do point nine. <laughs> 9.5. Almost a 10. Because I had in mind what I wanted this to come out like, and look, there it is in my glass. It took a, a bit of research and going back and forth on the two of us to come up with the recipe. So it was actually a, a very much a joint effort. Is it absolutely, positively, 100% perfection? No. That's it's why, a 9.5. That's why I didn't make it a 10. But it is so darn close that I couldn't rationally go any lower than a 9.5. All right. I guess I have to taste this now. Okay, on the smell, it's nail polish remover with pine salt. I had to preface this with, I drink whiskey neat, so you understand where I'm coming from. Okay, it's smoother than I thought it was gonna be based on the smell. The smell is so piney and strong that it's like, ugh, just a, it's nail polish remover and pine salt to me. On the flavor, it's okay. It's not my thing. It is just not in my wheelhouse. However, comparing this to our Kill You, if this didn't, if this had less ethanol in it, they're pretty close. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about it, and you just let me take a taste. I, I feel like this is just a stronger ABV and more punchy on the juniper side version of this. So I, I am so proud of ourselves. <laughs> oh, he's, he's doing the combo. Here, we'll just do that. Mix them together. Don't know if it's gonna be any better. Not for me. She'll probably like it. It definitely tastes more like gin. I think it, I like our wine better than I like the gin. I'll say that. I definitely like ours better than I like the gin. Mm. It's a personal mm. thing. When you mix them together, it enhances all of the good aspects of both. I get the warming effect of the Hendrix gin, but I'm also getting the sweetness and slight more palatable flavors of our kill you. Um, sorry, I just, I'm not a gin fan. If this was whiskey, I'd be all over it. <laughs> um, I am going to say that this was a success. This was Absolutely. a hands Absolutely. down success. I am so pleased. Me giving it a 6.5 does not make it a failure, no. by the way. Because no. 6.5 is actually on our scale, a pretty decent score, yeah. especially for something that is not my wheelhouse, not something that I would normally even, like I will never reach for this, okay? I'll just be totally honest. I will not drink one more drop of this until we do the one year tasting and then I'll probably never have it again unless the one year tasting turns out to be completely amazing. And you know what? I am okay with that. Yeah, I figured. Because <laughs> there's things that I make that she won't touch, you know, like the basic the basic meats. She doesn't really get into those. My spiced methaglin, she doesn't really get into those. The cap capsicamels and things like that. She doesn't, she's not into those. Let's be honest, I really didn't have a chance with the spice method one, so there's that. I did hide them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the benefit for us making a gin-based product, because I don't have to hide those. No, that can be <laughs> out, that can be right, right out in, in plain sight. Now, neon it, signs it'll be, flashing It'll be stuff. safe, no, not a worry. It's all me. I, I won't get that desperate for a drink. <laughs> Drink. Okay, well that makes it sound degrading. I gave it a 6.5. I know, I know. And so I... Now, I gave it a 6.5 based on an unbiased answer, okay? If I was to say, if someone handed this to me and said, what do you think of it? It would have been a lower score, okay? Because it's not something I like, but I know what it is and I know what it was meant to be. And 
compared to that, I, I mean, after drinking the Hendrix gin, I actually think my score should be higher because it's closer to the gin than I thought it was gonna be. But for my palate and my flavor profile, it's not a higher score, it's a lower score than that. So, does that make sense? We could ramble on infinitely about our experiences with this but gin instead, like product. Just have her finish this off. All right, um, so. Chug, Thank chug, you so much for chug, watching. Chug, 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 chug. Whoa, she did it. Hey guys, thanks for watching and have a great day. All right, so it's been about two more weeks and it's time to take a second reading. And as you can see by the fact that there's a preemptive empty fermenter here, we're kind of hopeful that it's done. And I need to do that again because I was looking at the screen rather than the camera. Always look at the camera. Look at Elmo. Please don't bring Elmo into this. <laughs> I have nightmares from Elmo. I'm sorry. And now we have a blooper. I didn't mean to traumatize you with Elmo. <laughs>